All right, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeff Eckhoff. I'm the Director of Planning and Development Services for the City of Sioux Falls. And I'm pleased to come to you today to talk to you about our comprehensive plan and our next steps for that. Um, throughout my time with the city, and actually before that even, uh, visitors to Sioux Falls uh, often comment, as well as people that I know and residents here, that Sioux Falls just appears to be a well-planned city. And that does not happen by accident. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of behind the scenes, uh, seeing how the sausage is made, if you will, that goes into that. And so today we're going to talk to you about the next steps as we embark on the, the uh, uh, process of coming to the next comprehensive plan. This is our kickoff today. And talk to you about why we do this, why it's important, how it works, and then I'll be introducing our partner from Confluence who's going to help lead us through that process. And we'll have that discussion here in a little bit as well. Um, in a nutshell, a comprehensive pl plan is a roadmap or a guide to our future, how our town will develop. But one of the things I'd like to talk about is that our administration talks a lot about keeping Sioux Falls investable. And when you say what does that mean, you often kind of go towards businesses, an obvious connection. We want to make sure they're able to be profitable, make sure that they're able to continue to develop and grow here. But it's equally important, if not more important, about neighborhoods and making sure neighborhoods are places that are convenient, that have access, they have connections to services such as schools, health care, as well as amenities like parks, libraries, uh, whole household uh, shopping, uh, grocery stores. All of that is a big part of making the entire community. So whether you own a home in Sioux Falls, you live in an apartment, or you own a business, it's an investable city that we create and preserve value for your whatever your, your economy of Sioux Falls is. And so this plan has a lot to do with creating and, and supporting that. It's not new. We, we passed our first comprehensive plan back in 1950, and then our latest Shape Sioux Falls plan, if you will, was uh, updated in 2016, and this will be the next major update. We've had some tweaks since then, but this will be the next major update to that. And of course, we're going to a catchy name. We're going to call it Shape Sioux Falls 2050, and you'll hear more about that going forward. Before we go uh, going further, I really want to uh, uh, compliment and thank uh, some of our staff that are leading this, uh, our uh, planning development, our future planning team, uh, and our senior planner, Fletcher Laycock, Laycock, who is really the lead on this for our department, and Aaron Bolfenkamp, who is uh, uh, project managing this from Public Works, our partners in Public Works, and those two are really doing the yeoman's duty and, and taking the lead. So I just want to thank them and compliment them on the work they've done to get us this far. Obviously, we involve our our, our our city partners with parks and public works and public safety and all those folks, libraries in this, in this process. But really today we want to focus on the external part of it, the public input, the public engagement they're going to be, that we will be doing for that. With that, we've engaged through an RFP process, Confluence, uh, to come in. You'll, you'll get to meet, meet Chris Shires here in just a minute, who is leading the effort for Confluence. It was important to us that we had kind of a neutral third party that, that could come in, take a fresh look, lead this process for us uh, as a, a very open book to our community uh, to lead public engagement, gather the, the data, and then give us an objective look at the data they gather uh, that will help lead us to the, the decisions we'll make as a community that we'll make together. In addition, we stood up an advisory committee of 29 people of citizens from, and residents across the city that represent development, housing, nonprofits, education, arts, uh, uh, the environment, all those different uh, areas that are important to putting this plan together. Uh, 29 people was a lot. We also tried to find people that could fill dual roles for us. So I'll, I'll give an example. Eric Gajkowski is on the is on the advisory committee. He's there as a, a member of the Downtown Sioux Falls Board, but he's also the state director for AARP. So he fills two roles for us and very important roles that we want to hear those voices. The full list of those members will be found on the website if you want to take a look to see who those folks are. And I thank them for their service as they go in this journey with us uh, to creating this plan. So in closing, I just would like to say that comprehensive plans are really written by the community for the community. This will be something our folks, our residents can own and they'd be a very active part of. Uh, there's a lot of national discussion, a lot of regional discussion, trends, ideas out there. Uh, and certainly we'll listen to those, we'll talk about those, 
but at the end of the day, this plan will be for Sioux Falls, by Sioux, people from Sioux Falls, about Sioux Falls. And so we're very excited about that, that local input. Um, if you talk about government, I know we have a national election coming up, but there's no level of government that affects you more than your local government. So this is your chance, uh, Sioux Falls, to be involved, to, uh, to give us input, whether online or in person. And, and again, Chris will, uh, will give those opportunities to you. And while 2050 seems like a long time from now, from now it's really not. And this is, is your city, it'll be your plan, and we really urge you to get involved. With that, I'd like to introduce Chris Shires, who is at the Confluence. Chris, is, uh, his, his whole career has been uh, dedicated to planning. He was a planning director for West Des Moines. The last 11 years, he's been with the Confluence, leading these exact types of efforts. Some of you may recognize him. He helped us with our, our downtown 2035 plan, has worked with other plans, and so is very familiar with Sioux Falls. So we're thrilled to have him here. And with that, I'll have Chris uh, take the rest of the program. Thank you. And then we'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you. All right, Jeff, thank you so much. Again, I'm Christopher Shires. I'm a principal with Confluence. Uh, Confluence is a Midwest-based landscape architecture, urban design, and planning firm. Uh, we do have a local office uh, here in Sioux Falls. We also have offices in Fargo, Minneapolis, uh, Chicago, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, Kansas City, Denver, uh, Omaha, and Des Moines. And I am from uh, our Des Moines office, but like Jeff uh, mentioned, I am familiar with Sioux Falls uh, and was uh, excited to assist uh, with the uh, downtown 2035 plan, which was recently adopted. Uh, Sioux Falls has a great tradition of proactively planning for its future, and so I'm very excited to be a, a part of this uh, process. Um, uh, this is a really important planning update uh, for the city's uh, future going forward. And so when we talk about a comprehensive plan or the comprehensive development plan for the city, uh, it impacts all of our residents' lives. Uh, this is a common planning process throughout the country. Cities and counties across the country uh, typically have some sort of master plan, uh, but many of us, many of our residents do not know what one is. And so I do wanna uh, run through a few slides to kind of explain a comprehensive plan and why it is important to all of us. And so a comprehensive plan or a comprehensive development plan, there's a lot of different terms for them, uh, a long range master plan, uh, but the big picture is it's a, it's a plan uh, to help us govern uh, the future uh, actions and activities of our city. Uh, what do we want to uh, uh, have as our focus points? What are the goals we want to achieve? And then how do we achieve those goals? On the next slide, there's a lot of components uh, that typically go into a comprehensive plan and what its goals. So it is future fo uh, focused. Where do we invest our public uh, infrastructure dollars today uh, to help uh, implement the future we see? Uh, what are uh, ways that we can encourage our strong and diverse economic base? Uh, we're looking at existing conditions today uh, to try to make some predictions and recommendations for the future. And it's something that is an evolving uh, document. It does change over time. So Jeff mentioned this is a plan looking out to 2050, uh, but we tend to think of uh, comprehensive plans of having about a 10-year shelf life uh, before it's really important that we take another evaluation and a recheck with our community residents on what's important to them, what are the things impacting their lives, and how can this plan uh, achieve our future goals. And of course, uh, this plan does help establish uh, those community goals, but it is a guiding and recommending plan. It is not a law, it is not an ordinance, um, it is a guide uh, for the future. And if we do it right, uh, it can really help reinforce the brand or what we think of uh, for our local community, such as Sioux Falls. On the next slide, uh, some of the major components we typically find within a plan, it's a lot of mapping, and one of the most important areas of the plan is our future land use uh, map and the plan components itself, helping us determine where we see areas for new uh, growth, uh, new housing, new business development, or what are areas within the city itself uh, that are warranted for redevelopment or new enhancements. Uh, there's an inventory of a lot of our existing conditions. Where are we today from our land use inventory? Uh, what's our infrastructure uh, setup look like? Uh, what are historical or archeological or important cultural features of the community? And, and very importantly, what's our housing stock? And what's some of our demands and needs going forward? everything uh, to cover uh, transportation and infrastructure to quality of life, uh, such as our parks and rec facilities. Uh, and then ever important again, is what are the goals, 
uh, policy considerations and action steps needed uh, to help implement uh, this plan. On the next slide, I want to uh, hit on some of the big things that we'll be considering. Uh, whenever we're doing a comprehensive plan, there are some uh, items we need to consider uh, for our changing uh, uh, environment. Uh, so we know important for this plan will be the topic of housing and its many forms. Uh, new technology, new emerging technology and the changes they'll have uh, on our community, uh, infrastructure, our economy, and the change in the retail market, uh, the future of how we work, uh, public health topics, uh, transportation and mobility, mobility being a fancy word for just all those other ways we move about, uh, resiliency, and then how do we protect our precious uh, natural resources. The other important thing a comprehensive plan does is helps us make some uh, zoning decisions. Where are areas for new growth and development? Uh, where do we see areas best for housing? Where are areas best for maybe business or industrial development? And what are those rules and regulations best uh, placed uh, to help us properly manage uh, growth and development and redevelopment? And so we use the comprehensive plan as a tool to help make decisions related uh, to zoning and zoning uh, regulations going forward. Again, it is a guiding document, but it can help us uh, provide our commissions as well as our elected officials uh, with uh, some recommendations on how to implement. And then uh, I do want to cover uh, the, the process. And so uh, updating a comprehensive plan is a time-consuming process. Uh, there's a lot of steps involved, and in this case, we broke it down into three major phases uh, with the goal that we are reaching out to the community, we're reaching out to the general public to get their ideas and impact uh, uh, input into uh, what's important to them, what are their values, what are their issues, uh, what are their ideas for the future, that this can be a strong community-driven, community-supported uh, uh, plan going forward. And so phase one, which we're wrapping up right now, is all about kicking off uh, the project. Uh, this is where we've engaged our steering committee, our advisory committee, uh, to help us uh, uh, provide guidance on the plan development, uh, as well as we've done our initial research and analysis. Phase two is a phase we're entering right now, uh, and then it'll run into uh, the second quarter of next year, where we're reaching out to the public before we've done any uh, plan development, any plan update work, to make sure we understand from the public what's important to them. Uh, what are their values? And we have a lot of different uh, methodologies uh, uh, we're going to employ uh, to reach out to the community. Uh, I don't want to miss any, so I'm looking down at my notes, uh, but we have a series of community listening sessions uh, kicking off soon uh, so we can get some initial feedback from the residents. Uh, we, of course, are going to do some uh, individual stakeholder interviews. Uh, not everybody is comfortable meeting at a public, uh, attending a public meeting or may not have time. Uh, so we're going to try to identify some key individuals, organizations, groups throughout the community that we can have some one-on-one -on -one candid conversations to hear from them. Uh, we also want to do some uh, targeted focus group meetings uh, to reach out to groups that typically are underrepresented or don't participate uh, in public processes. Again, this plan uh, is, uh, should and will be impacted uh, by the community members, and we want to get a broad cross-section of the community participating. Uh, between uh, the consultant team and your city staff, we'll be attending various uh, events uh, with uh, the city tent, uh, uh, these pop-up events, uh, to get the word out on the plan and steer traffic uh, to the city's website as well. Uh, moving forward, we'll be having some neighborhood workshops, uh, some other open houses, and then we're going to uh, roll out a statistically valid survey to approximately 300 residents of the community uh, being conducted by a professional survey company uh, that we can make sure that we have very good polling data, that we understand what's important to our residents, what their value systems um, and their opinions going forward. There will also be uh, online surveys uh, on our project website as well. Uh, where residents uh, who uh, maybe were not fortunate enough to be picked for that randomized survey uh, can also provide to us uh, their feedback, especially if they're not able to attend uh, one of our workshops or open houses. And of course, I've made reference to this. Uh, we, will have an, uh, we do have an online engagement website uh, that uh, folks can go to to find out when different events are occurring, an update on the plan development process, and then uh, participate in some of our online uh, surveys. 
Now, once we've wrapped up uh, this phase of public input, uh, that is when we'll be working with the advisory committee uh, to tell them what the data tells us, uh, to share with them the results of this public input and start setting some ideas of where we're heading with this plan update. Uh, we will draft that update and roll it back out to the community uh, through both the project website uh, as well as uh, in-person uh, workshops uh, to make sure we got it right uh, so that we can listen to the community members, share with what we've developed, and make sure uh, they understand the plan components, how their input has impacted the plan, uh, and then still being a draft, uh, we can make edits and adjustments before it's sent to the City Planning Commission for their review and consideration, and then ultimately on uh, to the uh, City Council for their final consideration and adoption. So moving forward, uh, we look forward to working with uh, the community members uh, to get their input on what they see for the future uh, of the city. Uh, I'm very excited about this uh, planning process. Uh, I'm excited uh, to work with uh, a city that is as, as uh, forward thinking uh, as Sioux Falls. And with that, uh, both Jeff and I are available to take your questions. Chris, you addressed a little bit of this, but I'll maybe ask Jeff as well. Um, the last planning process that was updated in 2016, how far out did that look? And then in addition to just that 10 year sort of look back that you mentioned, is there anything else specifically, specifically that makes you think now is the right time to be looking out yeah. toward 2050? The last one was 2040. Okay. And so it's kind of that next cycle we're looking at, you know, it's been about 10 years since that. And also, I think a lot of it too, if you may remember, Jody, with the downtown plan, we kind of, we jumped in a year or two sooner than we normally would have. And I think it's just reflective of the kind of the, the rapid growth that we've seen and the changes that we've seen uh, in the last few years, I think is, it made us believe it's now is the time to do that. And then just one other follow-up, <clears throat> I think, um, which is, you know, when I look at these, I think future land use and, and determining what that looks like. And certainly there's still a lot of potential new growth area as you look out to 2050, but we're starting to get maxed out in, mm -hmm. in a few directions given the suburban growth. So, I mean, with that in mind, maybe speak to, you know, the available area to be studied here, but also does that now make you take a closer look, as Chris mentioned, at the existing areas Land use may kind of be predetermined already, but but how do those existing land areas then start to maybe be addressed through something like the comprehensive yeah. plan? I, I think you just hit it right on the head of, of why this is important and why it's important to do it now. Um, Chris talked about not only the future land use, but certainly um, the redevelopment of areas and underdeveloped areas that we have as well. We kind of know where our boundaries are going east and south and, 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 and north. And, as you know, the Public Works Department is taking a 100-year look at infrastructure, particularly to the west, Basin 15 and beyond. And so as we start thinking in chunks of time beyond 10 years, and in Public Works cases, 40, 50 years, we're talking about water, and they're talking about infrastructure, I think it's really timely that this becomes part of that process and we walk together with all of our partners looking long-term. So you're right, we really need to take a look at those land uses, creating those regional uh, employment centers, how does that look, transportation, coordinating it all together. So the timing right now I think is, is critical that we set that stage for the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years and beyond. Jeff, what did, did you think that Shape Sioux Falls significantly changed the way we develop from the first, after 2016? Um, I think it was perceived as a lot of simplification of zoning, right? Um, but did it actually change the way we develop? Yes, is a short answer. Um, I think from the, from the perspective of someone who looked at it from the outside prior to coming to the city as well, right? And you talked about simplification and, and maybe that's, that, that's one way to talk about it. I think one of the things that it did, and, and, and Chris touched on it, Right, how comprehensive plans interact with zoning. And the fact that I think that with, through Shape Places and Shape Sioux Falls working together with our partners in, across the city, it made development more predictable. It made development more um, um, transparent for people to know what's going to be coming in these particular areas. Now obviously there's tweaks and there's changes and you sat through a lot of those council meetings with us as well. But I think what it did is it made the process more predictable, it made the process 
uh, more digestible for our development community and for people making decisions about where they live. Not perfect, obviously, but I think it was uh, in hand in hand with zoning. It did make things uh, go much smoother, more predictable, and I think as a result, we were able to develop faster and in, 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 in a smoother fashion than we would have without it. So a lot has happened since 2016, um, the pandemic, change in work habits, uh, the emergence of uh, strong towns in our community mm -hmm. and just the, the philosophy behind that mm -hmm. has been bubbling up and has been part of the discussion during municipal elections and different things. Mm -hmm. And there's just kind of a change in attitude about development perhaps. Do you think that this is the opportunity to incorporate a lot of that maybe change in thinking about how we develop? You know, that was kind of what we talked about of, of the national trends and discussions and talks on density and, and walkability. Yes, it's important we talk about that. How will that work for Sioux Falls? That's what we're trying to find out. That's what we want to see what people want as a majority of folks across all spectrums getting their, gathering their input. I think we're seeing some of those changes already, Patrick. We're seeing with the mixed town mid-use. Obviously, we're very uh, in, uh, conscious of walkability in the downtown areas and where walkability is, is, is um, able to be able to be achieved. Uh, we're looking at some of the, the bike uh, improvements we've made. We've put the active transportation board together. So those things we are looking at and working on, but, it's, it, but it is uh, something we'll talk about. It's part of the conversation. But again, I think it's important to know this goes back to the public input, public engagement, and people need to let us know what they're thinking because at the end of the day, that's, what, that's what's going to ultimately shape the direction this plan goes. And we know that people's default is convenience. So if you ask them, what do you want, they're going to say a big wide road, cheap gas, and you know, no stoplights. And world peace. How <laughs> How do you, how can you use this process to change behavior? I'm actually going to ask Chris about that. He's probably had more, 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 uh, more uh, experience with that. Well, and West Des Moines is maybe a good example that it is, West Des Moines is essentially one long suburb with a huge mall in the middle. How do you keep Sioux Falls be, from becoming West Des Moines? Yeah, so uh, some great questions in there, and I wanted to hit on a couple. And so first was maybe a concern on, well, what are we going to hear from the public? And I, I think sometimes we don't give them enough uh, credit that our community members are, are bigger picture thinkers than we sometimes give them credit to. Yes, on a certain end, uh, you know, we do want to have very convenient parking and ease of getting around, and I definitely want low gas prices too. Uh, but they also see the value of other things uh, that we've been moving uh, the needle on planning, uh, such as the walkability and livability of the communities. They also want that. And so this is where I think it's going to be important in our public engagement process to make sure we're asking good questions uh, to get a little bit farther deeper into not just I, I want it to be you know, a quick drive to the grocery store, uh, but I want to live in a meaningful neighborhood. And so that'll be some of our challenge to make sure we're reaching out to a broad cross-section and really asking some good probing questions. Uh, the other part is, uh, you know, what do we want our community to look like as it continues to grow and evolve? I think it's also providing kind of a palette of options. And so in some cases, having a more uh, uh, car-centric oriented retail area may be a option for an area and then in other areas having a more mixed-use walkable a little more urban of a footprint uh, is appropriate in, in one area. Uh, it's been my experience that one size does not fit all for, me, for any community and frankly uh, if I could take you on a tour of West Des Moines you might see uh, some areas you'd be a little surprised on and so yes West Des Moines has some big long retail strip malls but frankly, with the change of the retail economy, they've had to do some changes. And so they're currently known as a, the last uh, mall built in North America, but that mall is still a, is very um, uh, viable. But they've had to make other changes in the community because the office market has changed dramatically. And so uh, we can take lessons we've learned in Kansas City, Omaha, Des Moines, Minneapolis, and maybe uh, uh, give uh, some options uh, here in, in Sioux Falls. I have to give this community a lot of credit, though. 
uh, in all the areas I work, you do have a very forward thinking, I've said it several times, forward thinking uh, staff, elected body, and frankly, uh, community members. Um, Sioux Falls is, and the Metro, if we give a little bit of credit, uh, is a great area. And I, I see nothing but a continued positive growth trajectory. This plan gives us an opportunity to set the stage uh, for the future of what do we want that growth to look like and what do we want the redevelopment to look like, especially even with us here in downtown. What do we want to see downtown evolve to over time? I'm just curious to maybe expound a little more on the redevelopment options because I think that's different in this planning process maybe than previous ones. So do you plan to identify specific underutilized areas, redevelopment sites, and ask for input around those? Or are you asking bigger picture about what the public would like to see in some of the more established areas? Yeah, so so great question. And and you tell me when I go a little bit astray because I get pretty excited to, to kind of uh, uh, get into the weeds on things and maybe even uh, expand our own scope. Uh, uh, the first stage is really kind of the big picture. We want to know from the community members, uh, stakeholders, property owners, residents, business owners, what's important to them and what opportunities they see. And so a lot of our engagement is kind of what uh, a, a modified SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What are they excited about for the future? What do they love about their community? What do they see as an opportunity for, for improvement? And what areas are they concerned? So through that process, we are likely to uncover opportunities or areas that do benefit from a little more attention on a redevelopment standpoint. As much as this plan is going to look at the growth edges, and we'll be doing edge matching with our neighboring communities, uh, we do want to plan together, we do need to also look at our existing neighborhoods. What can we do to preserve and, and uh, uh, enhance uh, existing neighborhoods, or are there specific areas that really warrant a little deeper dive? And so uh, coming out of this plan may be some additional action steps to say, let's focus in. Just kind of like you have a downtown plan that does a lot of more detailed focusing in on improvements here. I know we have some uh, surrounding neighborhoods that uh, are likely to, to pop up on the radar screen of, of wanting some type of additional uh, analysis uh, of what they could be or, or how can we preserve and protect them.